with that, I think let's get started. And we're going to talk tomatoes in the beginning. Tomatoes is the most popular vegetable grown in our gardens. And here to tell us about some of the recent advancements in tomato production is Dr. Harleen Hatterman Valenti. And Harleen is a high value crop specialist for NDSU. Harleen, welcome to the forums. Okay, thank you, Tom. Welcome. Okay, so we're going to get started here um, with the presentation. And, and uh, you know, tomatoes, everyone has their, their favorite cultivar. And I'm not telling you that you have to switch that by any means. I just wanted to kind of bring some of you up to date on some of the, um, uh, I guess, research that has been happening um, over the, I'd say, less than uh, five years uh, on tomato production. And so as far as the breeding the perfect tomato, I think everyone realizes that you know, the store-bought tomatoes tend to be really poor texture, um, little aroma, even little, little less taste and like that. And, uh, but as a, as a homeowner and someone who's growing tomatoes in your backyard, you have a much larger variety of uh, cultivars that you can try. Many of you probably have your favorites that are early so that you can be the first one on the block to go and have a ripe tomato. Um, but uh, there's been a recent study in which you know, the breeders realized that, you know, that taste attributes are kind of lacking in star, uh, store bought, bought uh, tomatoes. And so they did a survey and the top three attributes were texture, which I would have thought flavor would have been, you know, first, but it wasn't, it was texture. And it makes sense. Every time you see someone in the store, they're always squeezing the tomato before they um, actually go and try to sniff if there's any aroma. So you can't, you know, from touching, I doubt if you're going to be able to go and understand what kind of flavor, but, you know, so if you're going to a store, one of the first two things you can probably do is, you know, texture and aroma. If you can smell any kind of the essence of the tomato, you know it's ripe. Texture, you're going to know it's ripe a little bit more. And, and flavor, of course, flavor involves a lot of things and is very subjected to human per perception. And I remember a, a professor talking about the human can only really perceive three different um, flavors at, at a time or flavors including aromas. You know, your senses can only perceive three at one time. So it's really difficult when you start mixing all those together. Okay, one of the more recent advancements has been the anthocyanin enhanced tomatoes. And um, the first uh, place that this occurred was at Oregon State University, where they used conventional breeding uh, to go and come up with this indigo series. And, and really what, what they have done is taken advantage of the synthesis pathways with that from wild tomato um, lines. Then in the, the UK, they actually did gene splicing technique and they utilized uh, two Snapdragon genes to go and increase the concentration. Now, the Oregon State ones have in fever, uh, mainly just uh, to... in the skins the increased anthocyanin um, and it's over traditional ones it's not near the level of the concentration by the UK group in which they had a hundred times um, greater concentration of anthocyanins. And so everyone's thinking about ha health attributes and antioxidants. And, and so uh, tomatoes, even though you are getting um, some of the anthocyanins, because that's your dark, your purples and your red pigments, you are having some of those in um, your regular red tomato level, but you're getting of even the more corn. now with these dark purple fruits. As far as cultivars, you can see there are a lot of uh, different cultivars that um, 
everyone's kind of jumping on that bandwagon to produce these. Uh, most of them are, are smaller though. Um, and one study I thought that was really interesting was um, another aspect of having these anthocyanin enriched tomatoes is that um, with that, they, they're able to extend the shelf life of these tomatoes because they have some of the, um, well, it, it prevents more of your infection with some of the diseases and it slows that whole ripening process. And so on this study, what they did was they used one of uh, Oregon State University's cultivars. And you can see they went with uh, 12 degrees centigrade light and light or darkness. And then they increased that temperature to either 24 degrees Celsius and light or darkness. And what they found was that with that cooler temperature, and that's just three rows of uh, the, um, the tomato looking from the top, looking from the side, and looking from the bottom. So those aren't all different uh, tomatoes um, as you go down those lines. But so you can see that for each of their replications, what they found was that that 12 degrees Celsius, so cooler temperature plus light was needed in order to go and really increase the anthocyanins in, in these tomatoes. Another um, area that I thought was uh, rather interesting was intercropping tomatoes. Um, as a homeowner, you know, you just have a set spot where your garden is. And with rotations, you always have to go and, and you, know, you don't want to put selenium on selenium and you got to move things around. But um, to conserve space, they've been looking at intercropping and how that works. And so in this one study, they intercrop zucchini, basil, green beans, and lettuce. And they compared the crops if they were just a monoculture or if they were intercropped. And they use this land equivalent ratio and the yield that they would get from that to determine which ones um, actually did the best. And I suppose if you think about how huge a zucchini plant can get, it wouldn't be, you know, hard to understand why um, the zucchini really was was not good as far when it comes to intercropping for the tomato yield. And, you know, tomato, they wanted to still maintain the tomato yield, yet see what other vegetables would work in well with that. So when you look at that first line and you see tomato zucchini and you see intercropped, uh, how small your, your uh, tomato yield is compared to the monoculture, of course, uh, when it comes to your zucchini, uh, it did about the same because it's so much more competitive if when it was intercropped to the monoculture. Um, Crotillaria is, um, it's kind of like a faba bean. It's called rattle bean and it has a small pod um, that they use. You can, this study was in um, Italy. Um, and so there you see, well, again, uh, you came up a little bit with your tomato uh, yield in our crop, but um, in comparison to zucchini, but still, it was still, you know, a good, uh, almost not quite half of what it, a monoculture. And then um, as far as the inner crop, uh, the tomato was um, much more competitive because you can see the inner crop, how it was so much lower. Um, when you go and look at tomato basil, uh, we keep moving up a little bit, but uh, you still with that inner crop, uh, even though I, I really didn't understand why those yields varied so much um, for the monoculture, you don't see that kind of yield variation. Uh, so uh, there could have been some things that are, were occurring there. I would have thought it would have been up in, in the 20s at least all the way through for the monoculture, but well, no, because you're talking about different plants. So the overall yield of the basil isn't gonna be that high um, 
in the first place. So you didn't have that much of a reduction. Um, when you look at the green bean and tomato, now we're finally getting up into that 30 uh, metric tons per hectare for the inner crop, which isn't that much lower from the monoculture. And even though you had a drop in the inner crop for the green beans, you still, um, it wasn't that bad in comparison. You had a land equivalent ratio of 1.2. You're looking for something over one to make it worthwhile. If it was just one, that means you would have been just as well with the monoculture. You weren't really gaining anything with that land equivalent ratio. So, and then finally, the tomato and lettuce, again, we actually even had a higher yield with the tomato, although I don't think it would be that much different um, if there was some statistics with that. And the intercropped of the lettuce, you saw that reduction, but that land equivalent ratio was 1.3, which again was over 1.2. So their conclusion was that the tomato green bean or tomato lettuce were the only two that really didn't decrease the tomato yield and had that land equivalent ratio um, greater than one. So greater than have it putting these two monocultures um, next to each other. So I thought that was rather interesting. And, and you saw that picture and that picture I had earlier, uh, I guess I can go back right there. Um, you know, what we're really taking advantage of is, you know, tomatoes kind of get going slowly and then they're going to start to overshadow everything. So if you can take advantage of that cool weather with something like a lettuce that loves the cool weather, um, even though you're trying to warm up everything and get those tomatoes growing as quickly as possible, it really works to an advantage. One other intercropping study I thought was really interesting was they're actually using an onion to go and and what it that onion does is it actually kind of stimulates the potato to go and and protect itself from verticillium and and so what they did here was they they planted tomatoes in a pot alone that's the tm and tomatoes with um, it, it's called a potato tomato or a potato onion, I'm sorry. Also is known as a nesting onion uh, in which it kind of puts little offshoots um, and so underground. So it's more of a, it has multiple bulbs that aren't as big as your regular onion, but it still can be used. It's more like a scallop I guess, uh, um, in comparison for scallion. I should say, and and so what they did then is they infected all of the tomatoes with verticillium, and as you can see there, the onions that weren't uh, the potato onions that were with the tomatoes actually you know virtually eliminated that disease from taking over the tomatoes, and and they actually had a lot of more technical stuff involved but it was really interesting that the onions were providing some kind of a sulfur um, containing defense compounds to the tomatoes so that they could even though they were inoculated with verticillium um, they didn't um, come down with the disease in comparison to the ones that didn't have the um, potato onions or the nesting onions intercropped with them so a question I always get is, you know, should I, should I go and what should I do to go and get my highest yield with my onion, with my tomatoes? Boy, I got all kinds of vegetables on my mind right now. And um, you know, you see pictures all the time how people use a stake and they'll have one liter, or you know, they'll use a cage and maybe they'll have a couple liters, maybe they'll have more than one liter, maybe they won't do anything to them. And the question always is, is do I need to do some pruning or should I just leave them be and, and just provide a way so that I don't have fruit on the ground and and keep the that from rotting. And you really should consider pruning tomatoes. Um, when you do that, you do improve the, the airflow through that. 
Um, also, some of that leaf removal, especially from the bottom, will go. Um, you can get bigger fruit, and you will get earlier ripening from this. And so, as far as leader number, there's you know one one report will go and say two was the maximum. Uh, another report will go and say multiple was the maximum. Another one says one. And I think it all depends on the pressure for diseases, where if you really need a lot of airflow, then a single liter is going to, of course, be your best because you're reducing uh, a lot of uh, airflow, which then goes and increases, potentially increases the incidence of diseases. And so I think what you do is probably limited by your, your situation and, and what you have available. But some things you should think about is, um, you know, doing a little bit of pruning to at least go and um, kind of start moving that growth upward and getting things off of the ground. Um, so removing the flowers until the plant is 12 to 18 inches tall actually goes and says, hey, put that initial energy that you have into the root system and in the structure of the plant, which is a good thing. Um, by removing the suckers beneath, beneath that first cluster, um, you then eliminate, well, when you get these suckers, there's always going to be energy going to those. So if you were looking at something, getting something taller, then you would do something like that. Um, but it's important to wait until that cluster because not at every node will you have a cluster. It's, us it's uh, usually on your third node. Sometimes it misses that. So wait until that cluster comes out so that you're not eliminating some of your fruit. Um, if you wanted to go and make sure that you had all the your tomatoes ripen before that first frost what they commonly do is four weeks before that expected frost date you tip the top of it that'll stop that growth and actually concentrate on ripening the fruit that's on that plant which uh, would be a, an important thing if you have no other means of going and keeping those plants from uh, succumbing to the frost but you can see on the right hand side there where they really pulled some of those leaves off of the bottom to allow, um, to eliminate a lot of that splashing. Grafting. So there's a lot of things grafting can do. And I think you can read about all of those, how if you have the right rootstock, you can overcome a lot of these stresses, be it abiotic or biotic stresses. <clears throat> there are two types of grafting. Um, Homo grafting is when you're grafting the same species on it. And, and what they've seen with that is sometimes they can increase their total soluble solids in the tomato and the concentration of your vitamin C. Um, another time they went and they didn't see that with the vitamin C, but with the titratable acidity. And another time they increased the yield, but none of the others. And so it's all over the board. And again, I think that all depends on your specific problem that you're trying to overcome with that rootstock. As far as heterografting, I know Dr. Lee does this in his intro class in which he puts a tomato onto a potato rootstock. Um, there's been another study in which they used the goji berry, and they found that they were able to increase not only the total soluble solids, their um, titratable acidity, vitamin C, but also that ratio of your solids to your acidity, which is good. Um, with the potato, um, I think the plant gets a little mixed up. Am I, am I supposed to be trying to put fruit or am I supposed to be trying to produce tubers? And so what they found was, you know, um, although that they did have some increases, the INC meant increases, they did see a decrease in, uh, uh, acidity and then fruit size and then with the potato they saw a large decrease in the tuber number the starch content but an increase in those reducing sugars so I guess they're sweeter um, which 
would be a taste attribute and a preference that you may have. But if you're going to try to fry those, they're going to get really dark on you. Um, and finally, the eggplant has also been used as a rootstock. And they actually were able to um, decrease bacterial wilt on the tomato by having the eggplant as a rootstock. So some cultivars to consider. Um, I think everyone again has their their preference, but these are some of uh, some heirlooms that if you want to try something rather different, um, a lot of times heirlooms you won't find these in the grocery store because they have a much thinner uh, skin, so they they're not good at transporting, and um, and so they and they work best if they're left to vine ripen completely. Again, something that isn't really conducive to these cultivars uh, uh, or to the grocery store because they'll go and harvest them at that breaker stage when they first just get that little tint of color other than green. Um, so some of these have a little bit higher in the anthocyanins, but uh, not the, the green zebra. Uh, the two Orange ones aren't heirlooms. Those are actually newer cultivars that have uh, a much higher content of beta carotene and vitamin C. And so over those yellow cultivars that you may have seen in the past and so and have been reported to be really tasty. If you really want to get to some uh, rather strange looking stuff, um, Syngenta has bred these heirloom lookalikes, and um, all of them are fusarium resistant, and they have some pretty funky names, Arawak, Tomawak, and Gigawak, and you can see they've kind of bred these convolutions into the tomato, which, you know, you can also see, find in some heirlooms, and taking advantage of a, an heirloom lookalike that has fusarium resistance in it and and so and i think i'm actually ahead of schedule <laughs> okay great all right we invite your questions out there and while i get going I, how about uh you know that study about uh intercropping mm -hmm. you know a lot of people say that uh you should plant basil with your tomatoes they think it improves the taste of the tomatoes is it just in the mind or what do you think about that companion planting yeah and and they didn't you know that study didn't do any kind of sensory evaluation that was basically looking at <clears throat> hey you have this many square foot of garden area if you want to optimize and get your highest land equivalent ratio um, then these are the things you should think about. But I could understand something like that. And, and you know, we, you didn't see that great of a decrease. Um, and if you wanted to go and, you know, it, it could work. It's just that you were not gaining anything over having a row of tomatoes and a row of uh, basil. How about there's a question about uh, you mentioned indeterminate vines. Uh, can you compare that with determinate vines and should you prune a determinate vine? Same way. Oh, excellent question. So, an indeterminate vine keeps on flowering while a determinate will go and pretty much sets all its flowers and then that's done. So if you are looking to go and have a crop at a relatively short period of time, but a bunch, then go more with a determinant. Um, while if you want to spread out that season as long as possible, even though in North Dakota that might be impossible, <laughs> you know, then the indeterminant, you, you shouldn't shouldn't go and uh you know prune really and a determinant vine about um a new north dakotan and curious about the planting season 
Uh, when's the time that we should start sowing your, your tomato seeds or, and also when can we set out transplants? Okay. So, uh, now that's an excellent question. That can go a lot of different directions and we could probably talk for the next 30 minutes on that, but we don't have that much time. So generally you will go and, and, and seed them about four weeks before, um, your four to eight weeks depending again, how much light you're gonna have. If you were in a greenhouse setting, you could get away easily with four weeks. If you're in your home and you're not getting as much sunlight and, and not putting as much nutrients to them, then maybe you're more towards that eight week period. Um, and, and then, you know, you just don't wanna set them, go from your house or that window and then put them outside and say, hey, you're on your own. It's always better, you have to, I like to build in at least a week to acclimate them. So I'll set them out during the day and I might bring it and bring them in at night. Or if I'm gonna keep them outside and make sure they're, they're kind of like by a south uh, facing uh, wall right next to it so that they're not gonna get a lot of wind whipping um, from the north or from the west and they're actually getting more sun coming and heat coming off of that wall to kind of get them used to um, the difference. Now, the difficult part about putting them on that south um, facing wall of your house is that might be too much sun if they were indoor and under a rather low light. So you might have to first kind of just put them out there for a few hours and try to avoid that peak really hot period of, of intense sunlight until they get a little bit more acclimated and put them out a little more, a little more each day. But I like to use a week to get them more acclimated. Harden them off. Harden them off. And yeah, tomatoes cannot take frost. No. Just gotta be careful about that. And probably uh, they prefer a warm soil. So maybe like late May is a good ballpark. Late May is a good ballpark. Right, yeah, I mean, you have seen the, the wall of water things, oh, things yeah, right. to go and, and, and try to um, help protect them because they are very sensitive to chill uh, injury and that's where a lot of uh, high tunnel producers get in trouble because they think oh I can get that much earlier because it's warm but then it cools down in those high tunnels so if you don't have something protecting them from that um, evening temperature then you can get some injury to them. Okay good. How about you mentioned a lot about the anthocyanin tomatoes. Um, can you talk, what is the health benefit of that? Well, now the, the one went and said they had as much anthocyanin as the blueberry. And so, um, so anthocyanins are these, you know, polyphenolics that are supposed to be antioxidants to, you know, help with a, a number of things. Um, and Prevent some cancer. Cancer, some, you know, aging aspects of not with um, radical free okay. ions uh, and, you know. How about their taste? Somebody's asking, how does that, those extra anthocyanins, how does that affect their flavor? Well, um, we were talking about that earlier, Tom, and you went and you said <laughs> someone had some of those Indigo series and they said, ooh, they didn't, they didn't have the greatest taste so anthocyanins aren't sugar and, and so um so there could be um, less sweetness uh, associated with it sometimes people eat with their eyes too yeah and, and they're just not comfortable eating a, a blue Dark. tomato yeah how about uh we got a few disease questions here yeah did you want to briefly talk about blossom and rot, where you got that black bottom on the tomatoes? Mm -hmm. How can we prevent blossom and rot? Okay, so blossom and rot really comes around from the, your water cycling. I know they say it's calcium, but it, again, it's, it gets back to the water and the drying out and then wetting and, and having something dry out too much and then being rewatered. And so trying to keep a little bit more uniform soil moisture will go a long way. How about, uh, how can we control bacterial leaf spot? 
Okay, yeah, so back to uh, well, I'm not a plant pathologist, but <laughs> um, so a lot of those leaf spots though come from you know that there there's inoculum on the soil, and when things splatter, then the spores get splattered onto the leaf, and then they just keep moving their way up. So you know, preventing that from happening, um, there are a lot of cultivars that have um, various resistance, you know, the resistant, maybe, I mean, there's, some of them have six letters behind them for all the diseases that they're um, resistant to. So like bacteria need free water and wounds. So, you know, keep the foliage mm -hmm. dry when you water, avoid overhead irrigation Excellent. and don't play in the garden when it's wet. Cause you, you know, you're going to be making wounds in the vines. You can't help it. And then with that free water there, it's just making entrance, entrance little holes for the bacteria to slip in. And, you know, of course, good crop, good uh, crop management can help too. And speaking of crop uh, rotation, or do you have some, some vegetables that you would recommend that you rotate and some that you do not recommend rotate with tomatoes? I just, in my garden, I just try to segment it off so I always keep moving things and uh, you know and you also have to think of similar like you get eggplants and, you know none of the solanaceae so I'll stay away from peppers eggplants being in there going with maybe more of your leafy stuff um, or broccoli you know brassicas are always good to go and put in after something like a tomato Right, so just stay away with the tomato, stay away from the tomato family when you rotate. And like Carlene said, potato, pepper, eggplant, they're all in the same family to get the same diseases. Okay, what's your favorite tomato, Carlene? How about that? Ooh, well, actually, I'm, I'm very partial to Romas. Um, and so I make a lot of salsa. Yeah. And so... How does that anthocyanin survive in the canning process? Do you know about that? Well, I would think that wouldn't be good. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not sure how well that color will maintain, um, but I would, any kind of a heating process really re reduces it somewhat. Uh, back to bacterial leaf spot, they're looking for a chemical they can spray to protect their plants. Um, I it, tell them send me an email. <laughs> I'll get back to them. I'd have to look. Something I, I like just... copper or sulfur can do the job for you. Okay. I mean that's about all you got. Yeah. As a fungicide, yeah, will not help a bacteria. So, but I thought they said, oh, they said bacterial leaf spot. Bacterial leaf spot. Yeah. So a lot so... of organic growers use uh, a copper sulfur. Um, also, I probably important on copper. on rotation with something like that and yeah. and um, um, good seed source or good that's plant right. source that's right make sure you have a clean seed um, what else we got here uh, how about uh, using eggshells to add calcium in the tomato hole plant hole how many eggs should you use per plant <laughs> I I think there would be. You don't do that. I don't. I'm sorry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we don't eat enough eggs. It's just Steve and me. Yeah. And, and <laughs> too many aroma plants. Huh? <laughs> yeah. You know, the thing about eggshells is, um, for for those uh, shells to be taken up by the plant, it has to be the most fine possible powder for it to be taken up. So it's not really a practical approach at least in the short term, for using uh, eggshells. And also calcium is typically abundant in soils to begin with, so it's, mm -hmm. it's not necessary. How about when you prune a tomato vine, um, do, you, do you prune, uh, it says, do you prune just a flower? Or are they talking about pruning? You don't want to prune the flowers. Yeah. Do you, you want, you're talking about pruning like just uh, below or above the first flower cluster is right. that what you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. So we're not we're not pruning the flowers. We're just using that flower cluster as a guide to find a, yep. a good 
strong vine besides the main vine. Yeah. And, you know, some of those tomatoes will come with a cluster of uh, five to seven, you know, fruit. Right. And you, if you did eliminate a, a few of them, the remaining ones are going to be get bigger. But, you know, not that. It is like you're going to get twice the size. If you eliminate one mm -hmm. tomato, the next one isn't going to be twice as big. So... Um, what do you do about volunteer tomatoes? I know I really hate to kill something, but volunteers are always going to come up much later. They're they're never going to go and produce much of a crop, so eliminate. You know, they're they're just a weed in those instances. Um, they're they're not going to yeah. come out of the ground, especially here in North Dakota, uh, until much later. So a sharp hole <laughs> yes. you recommend. <laughs> yes. Sounds good. Uh, do you like uh, adding coffee grounds to your tomato patch? I haven't. <clears throat> I've started drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, coffee grounds would add organic matter, so it would be a plus. It's not going to be uh, earth-shattering, excuse the pun, but uh, it will improve structure a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if you got to get rid of the coffee grounds. But I would think a compost, if you could get oh, yeah, a compost, compost yeah, that's and, um, and get them a much better. <clears throat> okay, what do you do if you got a tomato plant infected with verticillium? Mm -hmm. Well, now uh, have your potato <laughs> onions. <laughs> Quick plant a potato onion, you know, or a nesting onion. Um, so if it is, I, I think the it's best thing is get get rid of it because yes. it's going to spread otherwise. It's, um, it's a fungus inside the stem. Sorry, there's no we got it. It's it's a goner. Yeah, pull it out and get it out of there. Before, and uh, because try to find a resistant variety in yeah. the future. Yeah, we got lots of good resistant. Yeah, there varieties there are there. lots and lots that have. Verticillium resistance. Um, okay, we're going to just keep going just for a couple minutes here. Uh, do eggshells help to keep the slugs away? We got a lot of eggshells in North Dakota to deal with. A little bit. Diatomaceous earth yeah. is usually what's used mm -hmm. with that kind of situation. And there are uh, there are, uh, iron phosphate products. And if you have slug, then I think you have way too much foliage um, and you should be getting rid of some of that stuff down low so that uh, uh, you do not have that. Yeah. Uh, how about should we put an antacid in the hole to prevent blossom and rot? Again, uh, like you said, we, there's plenty of calcium. It's, it's more of the water cycling, you know, that is the main um, cause of blossom and rot. <clears throat> That's right. It's, if antacids really did the job, man, can you imagine the market there'd be for antacids among gardeners? So you can do a test if you want. You know, let's say you buy uh, six mm -hmm. tomato plants, get your husband to put antacids in three of the plant holes, but not tell you, and then see later if it makes mm -hmm. a difference. And then you'll find out that it's not really going to make a difference. But uh, but you can try. How about this uh, for that verticillium wilt? Does any type of onion help prevent that, or only potato onions? I think it's more that potato onion, uh, that nesting onion, because it has multiple bulbs, and and the fact that it, you know, it's different than your regular um, onion. So. Okay. <clears throat> about. Um, Anything we can do about early or late blight? Well, or septoria. We got some. Um, again, um, go. You know, if you always have a lot of problems with early blight, I don't think there's a lot. I mean, generally, if someone's going to have problems with late blight, it's because the plants were infected when they bought them. Um, but uh, you know, again, try to get more of your resistant cultivars and uh, uh, that again is if you get more air through you, you'll help a lot 
but there are some cultivars that are really sensitive to early blight, and so they're like that canary in the minefield type thing. Keep the foliage dry, and there are fungicides that can be used to prevent infection and have a shield of protection. There's lots of fungicides like chlorophyll, and that mm -hmm. was widely available and yeah. very safe. Um, what I think, uh, boy, we, you know, people just want to add things in their plant hole, banana peels. Okay, if you just, we're kind of, the big pictures we're talking about, start a compost pile. That would be a good idea to go. And there's no magic cure for putting stuff in a plant hole. Um, I think you're better off with tomatoes, making sure that you have, you know, if you could go and plant part of that stem and have more adventitious um, rooting occur. Um, would be a lot better than trying to put something in the hole with it. Okay, I think uh, we've covered we've covered all the questions. I think we got a lot of comments going on, but we got that's one of the questions. And uh, so we're going to stay on time tonight. So Harleen, thank you for You're the talk. Welcome. Sure, thank learned you. a lot. Appreciate it. You're welcome. And we're going to take a five minute break now, and then we're going to start talking about 